So today uh, we have as our guest, Professor uh, Ray Stokes from the University of Glasgow. My name is Martin Corpy. I'm a researcher at the, uh, the Ratio Institute. We, uh, we prepare the Ratio Dialogue sort of to follow up our yearly guests that we have here to present, to give the Heckscher Lecture at the Stockholm School of Economics. I was starting with Eli, Eli Heckscher, and he had this view that, that economics and economic history is more or less one discipline. Um, and I'm thinking, what is your take on this? How do you see the division of labor? If we start like in a broad kind of sense and then move into business history here, mm -hmm. uh, which was the topic yesterday of your talk, um, but in, in kind of light of the, the um, LIF Heckscher's approach, how do you see this kind of division of labor between economics, which is a deductive uh, kind of, and, and economic history, which is a more inductive way of doing uh, science? And um, I'm kind of curious of your, your kind of thoughts of, of where the subject of economic history, or the discipline of economic history is in relation to economics and and uh, your views on that. First of all, I think that Heckscher um, was somebody who thought broadly and across fields, and, and, and mm -hmm. I think that that is is an important thing uh, to do for 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 anyone in any field is to is to be open to to other fields. That having been said, there are disciplines that are different, and and mm -hmm. I think that economics as a discipline and history as a discipline. Including economic history, mm. um, which is uh, they are separate from each other and have different norms. I mean, you, mm. you indicated there's a methodological or um, difference in ded deductive versus inductive approaches. Mm. There's a difference in terms of theoretical, uh, with an aim at prediction um, yeah. for mu much of economics, uh, whereas economic history uh, is not predictive it, uh, and especially if it's truly history it doesn't pretend to predict and, and I actually think would posit that it's impossible to predict mm -hmm. um, that that <clears throat> is what you learn from economic history is that you expect the unexpected and and, and not that's having been said you see patterns and there are general gener generalities and there that's where the <clears throat> the Concern with both of both fields with the economy mm. generally mm. Uh, is a, a meeting point where where they can talk to each other. Mm. I think though that economics as uh, as a discipline as practiced certainly in the Anglo-Saxon world, but also in other parts of the world, is um, is a discipline that's high, highly mathematical and mm. uh, increasingly so uh, and uh, dedicated to uh, what historians would think most historians would think is 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 relatively small problems for a very small audience mm. even though they're taken very seriously mm. by a lot more people than take historians seriously probably mm. um, but um, I, so I think that there there are differences um, but there is a common concern and therefore there is a possibility of reaching across there and there are in fact economists uh, who are not in the, the main mainstream of econ eco economics, but are important econ economists in evolutionary economics, for instance, mm. who are very open to dialogue with historians, and historians yeah, sure. are uh, economic historians are very open to dialogue with them. Mm. I think the other thing, what I said la la last night in the lecture, was about economic history and the way that's gone, partly because of the um, the disciplinary or, or the um, departmental placement of economic historians um, within within universities mm. is that much of the field has gone in the direction of econ econometrics, okay. uh, and that is uh, where there is a divergence between economic history and the rest of mm. um, economics oriented history. Uh, although there continues to be a lot of narrative um, em empirical work in uh, mm. and, and less theoretical work uh, or qualitative theoretical work in economic history um, that 
is tends not to be the mainstream anymore. If you look at the, journal, the leading journals, the Journal of Economic yeah. History and Economic History Review, the percentage of articles that are econometric has gone way up. Okay. Um, in, earlier in the JEH and more recently in the EHR, but they're both mm. going that direction. Mm. But aren't they getting more econometric because they kind of they're starting more from a theory and they want to to either falsify or try to find support for theory. And um, how would you do that? It seems like uh, I, I gather from your talk yesterday that you kind of uh, you don't want to have a theoretical approach and try to uh, try to go into a research problem from the angle of, of theory. Mm -hmm. Uh, rather, you're more kind of open, and you're open to uh, kind of what's unusual, and that kind of um, it brings me to the role of, of what is the role of science? Is it is it to to find generalities and and then uh, kind of tease out what is not general and what is um, what is specific for a certain time and uh, and uh, in a certain industry, for example. Uh, well, um, I, I mean, I think that the, the, the um, I'm not opposed to theory, I, uh, I, even though I, 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 I'm really uh, suspicious of much theory. Mm. Um, and why I, are you suspicious? <laughs> <laughs> I think because because it's over, overly general, okay. um, and, and 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 the the whole idea of history, economic history, industrial history, business history, or history, yeah. history, history, mm -hmm. is to emphasize to privilege the unusual or the unique and so there, there's a different starting point i mean that that was is different from the rest of the social sciences including mm. um f from the late from the from the mid to late 19th century and that, mm. that's been the case that history has been different from the rest of the social sciences that having been said history modern history the way history is done now is Coterminous with the beginning of social sciences in the mid nineteenth mm. century, it was mm. a, one of the original social sciences, but it has a sort of different uh, logic to it. I think there is, if, if I can say that there is a there's an underlying theory to historical research, okay. which is about the method, mm. and historical source criticism mm. is the method that historians use to um, to evaluate evidence mm. uh, and to uh, decide on whether something is important or not important, reliable or not reliable, a whole range of other things, all of which is related to science. I mean, that, mm. that is a scientific uh, value mm. to, to, to determine those kind of things. Uh, but it's a different way of doing that. And it's also that, that his, when I say historical so source criticism, that's a shorthand for a lot of different things that nobody ever really mm. puts into a paper uh, very rarely puts into a paper. They don't talk about historical methodology when they're doing history. They they don't talk about that. So there is that aspect of it. Second point I would make: history is uh, about um, if it's only about something that never will happen again mm. yeah. and never happened before mm. is well, it might be interesting. Mm. <laughs> it, it might be a good. Uh, well, we may not learn a lot. From it. it may be a good topic for a novel, but we may, may not mm. learn a whole mm. lot from it. So, in that sense, it's not it's not science. Um, mm. In, in th that kind of history, is not science, and there is a lot of really bad history mm. that is b basically just one thing after another. Uh, this happened, that happened, that happened. It's basically chronology, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, or it's a, st a great story uh, about some weird and wacky person or mm, or mm. Uh, so, something that happened that you, you wouldn't wouldn't expect and that doesn't have a broader significance so history without generalities mm. is not good history in my my view so there has to be some generalization the the the, the issue for me uh, and I think for for most people who come at economic history from the point of view of history mm. is that we um, are suspicious about the high level generalization mm. because we recognize that most things that happen are time and place specific, uh, at least to some extent. So the generalization is about that time and place more than 
about humanity in general or or whatever. Hmm. So, for instance, there there's a great old book by a guy called Crane, Crane Brinton, an American historian okay. who who called who, who did a book called The Anatomy of a Revolution, okay. a historian who looked at several revolutions, hmm. and he came up with a pattern to revolutions, which is based on the French Revolution, but which seems to be applicable to to most revolutions that has to do with the the reasons for why the thing happens to begin with, how it escalates, yeah. how there's a reaction to it, uh, and, and then there's a Napoleonic figure mm -hmm. that eventually comes into it too. Those patterns do seem to apply across the board. Yeah, you have a model of how this happens. It's a it's a Which model. Which I'd be very happy with. <laughs> but, but, but it doesn't tell if you I anything such about... such a model. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but you, it doesn't tell you anything about when yeah. the second stage is going to happen, no. for instance. Uh, it, it, so applying it to the specific thing, you know that these are the things that are going to happen. You just don't know when they're going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a danger in, in, in other words, I see that as a mid-level generalization that something, there's a pattern here, mm -hmm. um, but we can't apply it uh, across the board because sometimes revolutions have a very long uh say second phase or third phase or whatever the, the phases are in that that model yeah. um, they, and, or sometimes they skip them or sometimes they go backwards um, and that's the, the the other thing about stage stage theories that's that, that's important mm -hmm. and another reason why it's a mid-level generalization rather than hmm. theory so you're basically okay with a if a model kind of is is mid-level generalizations uh, oh I, I think that that's really where historians can excel mm. and i think that's where the meeting point is for a potential meeting point is for mm. other disciplines and history to yeah. come together and i think that the and one of the questions last night had to do with again with um my alleged um mm. re reluctance to engage in theory um i i i don't I, I just use a different word, I think. Okay. And I think it's important to use that different word because what is understood by theory is something that is really general. And okay. I think that the, the much of the social science um, work has been motivated by an attempt to be like the natural sciences. Yeah. And the natural sciences are uh, different, especially... Uh, um, mm in physics, which is the high level natural science, that the possibility for generalization there is very high. But but it, as we see, as we've seen in the history of physics, mm. that these theories are in fact mid-level generalizations that when they're tested actually are completely thrown, mm. thrown overboard. Mm. Or Newton was right, but mm. When we go to this level of the the, the uh, atomic particles, then he's not right anymore. Mm -hmm. So that that's where. So f for everyday life, Newton is fine. Um, for yeah. understanding how to um, mm -hmm. the, the sun works, then it, it, it or mm -hmm. how quantum physics works. That 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 doesn't apply. Okay, moving on to yesterday's topic. You were talking about the kind of division of. Or, how economic history is divided between business history and then more broad general economic history mm -hmm. and um, so my question and you propose kind of this this um, industry industrial history is a kind of meso level or a, mm -hmm. a, 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 a kind of discipline in between mm -hmm. could you elaborate a little bit uh, what do you think are the weaknesses today with business history on the one hand and economic history is a broader and and what would the the potential role be for for industrial history there and what gap does that fill exactly by looking at at the industry per se and not kind of the business or the the broader economy well i think the point i have to say that one of the um the, the questions last night prompted me to to to, to say that um 
that looking at the field from the outside, yeah. um, you're going to see a lot of similarities. And looking at it from the mm-hmm. from the inside, you're going to see a lot of difference. And that's w- one of the things that, I, that I'm aware of. Uh, and when I'm when I'm talking about this, and I'm also saying that there are a lot of exceptions to what I'm about to say. Yeah. But economic history uh, started off. Um, Heckscher was was somebody who who, uh, who who did it. There were a number of economists who all, uh, uh, Keynes did some economic history. Yeah. Um, the, all, you know, major economists, John Kenneth Galbraith, mm. did a lot of, on on economic yeah, history. Sure. Uh, a lot of really, and, and if you read Keynes or or Galbraith, you can read it. Even if you're not an economist, yeah, sure. you can read it. Um, so it's it's, but that's not the way economic history has gone in, in recent years. It's gone more in the direction of econometrics, uh, and more esoteric in that regard. Theory testing uh, and theory development, um, but uh, I think it's not sort of traditional narrative economic history, yeah. um, business history. So that that is what I see as the problem. A main problem with economic history mm. nowadays. Business history, on the other hand, is less theoretical. Mm. Um, although there is quite a bit of qualitative theory that's in, involved in it, um, there is a and again there there are many exceptions to this, but there is a danger of business history being one case study after after another. Sure. And the case study, again, it might be interesting. Mm. But so mm. what? Mm. So what does that tell us in general about mm. anything? Yeah. Um, and so that's that's the one thing. The, the other thing is that the economic history l- looks at whether narrative or otherwise looks at flows of people, resources, um, whatever yeah. ideas. Mm. Whereas business history looks at actors. Mm. Uh, they're they're lo- looking at the firm managers within the oh, firm, sure. the maybe the workers within the firm. Uh, and the uh, the strategies that they they develop. So it's very micro level and versus macro level. Mm. Uh, and those you know flows without actors doesn't tell you how the flows happen. Yeah. It's a black basically a black box. Mm. The actors without flows is decontextualized okay. and, and perhaps um, not all that interesting. And I think industrial history as as it's not been done that much in, in in the recent past, but it can be a way of linking those two things right. because you're looking at more than one actor. The, the, the case study is, mm. is an industry, but an industry is more complex than a firm. It's it's also not a, mm. a legal entity. It's not. Mm. It, there's a whole lot of differences, and and it changes over time, uh, which is the historical dimension to yeah. it. But it's a, it, understanding the actors and the way they strategize and they interact with each other that is you're looking at the the the, the interaction of of actors uh, over time but that interaction also means that they are linking or that, that they they're interacting in part because the environment around them is changing the context mm-hmm. is changing the flows are changing yeah. so different countries become wealthier than other countries, and that means new markets for these mm. this industry or, and the firms within it. And so that is what I'm suggesting is is a way of, of doing that. Industrial history has not been done, for the most part, in that way. And so far as industrial history has been done in the past, it, there was a sort of phase in the, uh, especially in the 70s and so, so on, mm-hmm. uh, 70s and 80s, they were t- talking about the you know, history of the coal industry, the history of this. Yeah. If you look at those things, they aren't talking about specific firms. They're talking about changes in technology, the change, changes in markets, changes mm-hmm. in... So it's more related to economic history and flows mm. rather than actors. Okay. And what I'm suggesting is bringing something from business history, which is the actors, but not just one actor and not just Mm. a handful of actors, but a a large number of them, looking at them over time. And also because industrial history in the past has been often very regional or local, Mm. but industrial history can be global. And that is where it becomes very interesting, Mm. the international aspect Mm. of it, especially Mm. over time as global markets emerge or change Mm. uh, as they have done recently. Mm. All right. I have some... um... 
I'm kind of curious what your perspective would be as someone who does studies industries and industrial development. Um, kind of, there's this current ongoing debate between the uh, people who who want the state or the government to have a a much broader and important role in kind of furthering different technologies, especially in light of the, the climate crisis and uh, kind of the entrepreneurial state, Mazzucato people. And then you have a lot of research that has been done here at the Rotsi Institute, for instance, where people are criticizing this uh, for missing a lot of things or the dynamics that are actually taking place when an industry or a technology develops. Uh, I'm kind of curious what your your take on this as someone who studies development within industries over time, um, what do you see, what role do you see for government policy or how can it further development or what should it do or what should it not do? <laughs> what are your, your uh, kind of, your, your thoughts from that, that uh, as, as a business historian and industrial and economic historian? Well, I, th I mean, I think that that's that is one of the things that I think is is most interesting over the course of time is that changing relationship between between the state and and, and the company, and uh, under the National Systems of Innovation Framework, for instance, yeah. which is developed by uh, economists and 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 um, uh, evolutionary economists and and uh, a, a number of other fields, uh, including historians uh, mm -hmm. uh, involved in it, um, that th this the there's a division of labor between <coughs> government, uh, universities, and and uh, so higher education and and the firm. The yeah. firm, uh, Richard Nelson, the uh, one of the main proponents of this uh, this approach. Uh, has argued that the firm is where the innovation takes place, yeah. but the firm can't innovate without the connections to the other parts of the so-called triple helix. And I think mm -hmm. that's a good way of thinking about about it. In certain technologies, the state doesn't need to be involved, mm -hmm. um, but in other technologies, it it does because there's no doubt, for instance, that um, the Haber Bosch process, which I talked about, which is a, for fixing ammonia uh, was brought up to scale, industrial scale, mm. to be able to produce. And what it did eventually was allow a lot more people to live in this world than had been the case before because it was much more uh, fertilizer for food and, uh, than before. It was also mm. a lot more weapons mm. uh, that were possible as a result of it. So there's a downside to it. But mm. that um, technology was developed using state funding uh, it was f developed much more rapidly than it would have been mm. otherwise. Okay. We don't know what would have happened because mm. counterfactual, but probably it wouldn't have happened without the state being involved, not mm. as quickly as it and happened. The German state, in this yeah, point. and they're the ones who who who, who did that. Similarly, um, synthetic rubber, which is a key technology for uh, for for the tire industry as well as all, mm. a lot of other industries, that wouldn't have been brought up to scale in the, in the technologies that are used now mm -hmm. without state intervention. Um, a lot of times these technologies are very expensive to begin with and, mm -hmm. and, and therefore there's, and, and there's often no market or mm -hmm. a, a limited market. Um, and therefore the state has to be involved. And, and so the state, state's role in that is, is sometimes very, very prominent and mm -hmm. recycling technology which is something I've looked at um, mm. in work on, on the origins of the idea of waste management. Um, recycling technology wouldn't have developed in the way that it did without state mandates on recycling, oh, right. which then promote uh, the design of artifacts, uh, of, of things to be um, determined in part by recyclability. Mm. That it becomes a design criterion mm. by virtue of state action. So I think that's the that's a, that's important. What they shouldn't do, what the state mm. can't yeah. do, I think, mm. is understand. And, and in fact, probably nobody understands it exactly. Um, but the state probably doesn't have the expertise to to know. No, I guess what that's exactly the that the state doesn't have the capacity to. Pick winners, as yeah. they say, and that's that's um, was a problem with uh, the Ministry of International Trade and Industry in Japan, for instance, which which 
did try to pick winners mm. and was very successful a lot of times. I mean, mm. if you're a gambler or if they if they were assessed as being good at gambling, you know, they're pretty good at gambling. But mm. Mm. they uh, also made huge errors. I mean, when mm. they said to um, Soichiro Honda, mm. um, you're you're never going to sell any cars abroad. Mm. Um, so, so <laughs> they, so like Apple not they, signing they, Beatles. Yes, it's mm. that's it, 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 it's it, they they got things wrong, and yeah. and that and that's not surprising because they're not expert in they can't be expert in every field. They can't be be expert, and because there are a lot of things that have to for most technologies that have to come together to uh, allow for. Um, for that technology to, to, to develop and, and, and that is inherently something that must be left somewhat to the, to the, to the free market. So I'm a great fan of government intervention. Mm. I think this happens uh, and it can be very positive. In fact, mm. it's absolutely necessary in certain areas. Mm. Climate, green, green technologies okay. is probably one of the areas. Um, but uh, the idea of guiding exactly which which te- or choosing which technology is better than the other mm. is something that's very difficult to do. And in fact, um, evolutionary economists have looked, for instance, at the competition between Betamax, yeah. um, that's a classic study, and yeah. VHS uh, as a as video as a classic yeah. uh, study. The, the superior technology, Betamax, it's lost just, out to yeah. VHS. Why does that happen? Was a complex argument. But it basically has to do with the, the fact that the Betamax was solving a different problem mm. and that it was too expensive, mm. that it didn't have all the software, the movie titles that the other the, the VHS had. Mm. And you needed two tapes instead of one mm-hmm. for Betamax versus versus the other. So mm. there's a whole lot of things going on there at the same time. Could a government have predicted which of those two was going to no, because yep. that it was emergent. I, I mm. think that that and that's. I mean, Sony was the inventor of Betamax, mm. not exactly a, a seen as a firm that picks losers, no. but they picked picked a not a big winner anyway no, okay. um, in this particular case because they couldn't anticipate. They were trying to solve a problem, which was how do we make a time machine? Mm. How do we record? television so that people can watch it later. That was mm. the problem they were solving. It wasn't, let's have our theater, our, our movie theater in the house rather than okay. somewhere else. So, so if we kind of, uh, what, if we want to tease out some kind of lessons from these examples, what would they, would you suggest that that kind of government support or, or government intervention would be sort of broad in we want to move from A to B? And, and uh, I don't know how 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 these uh, support system or innovation systems were designed at that time. But um, um, well, if you don't want to try to pick winners, as you shouldn't do, mm-hmm. uh, what would um, what would a, a fruitful kind of industrial policy look like from from the perspective of of these examples that you mentioned, for instance? Uh, That's a good question. Yeah. I, I think that <laughs> I, I, it's, it, if um, if I knew the absolute answer yeah, to yeah, it, sure. I would be a very re- wealthy gentleman. Yeah. But um, I I think that there are lessons that we can learn from it. In that, first of all, the I think that the 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 role of government is to identify um, broad societal needs mm. um, and to recognize when the private sector is. Mm going to be able and willing to do something that is going to satisfy those needs and when it isn't. Mm. And I think that's one would be one criterion for mm. for deciding how to how to spend money. Mm. Because the fact is, uh, for instance, um, the private sector, uh, in the electrical uh, industry uh, and, and the electronics industry need to have um, standards that are Uniform, so that yeah. the power doesn't it works across the board. There, mm-hmm. there are differences in power systems around the world, but within a country or between countries, the European power system is all 220 volts and so so on. There and but developing those standards is something that's in the interest of the economy, in the interest of all the firms involved. Sure. But there's no firm that 
can afford to do that, uh-huh. nor can they own the standard. Uh-huh. So there's no incentive for them to do it. The government uh-huh. must do that kind of thing. Uh-huh. Uh, so that's one area that, that they have to do. And then the other thing is to identify, like, like I said, identify broad goals, uh-huh. such as we need to recycle 90% of our garbage. Mm. Um, and they have the government would have to look into whether that's feasible or not. Mm. Um, but uh, it, it has been shown to be to be feasible, and then uh, work out how to attract the private sector mm. to do that, mm. um, and, because the government doesn't have the expertise to be able no, to so. to develop that. Uh, nor do they necessarily have the expertise to choose the private firms to do it. So but what they have to recognize is that recycling of certain things, newspapers, glass, PET bottles, mm. aluminum uh, cans, mm. uh, steel, is always pays. Mm. Recycling of composite plastics, um, so certain types of other it's it's cost money to do mm-hmm. that and those markets fluctuate all the time and sometimes and mm-hmm. so the private sector may or may not be interested in in mm-hmm. doing some of that recycling and so as the recycler of last resort or the as the uh, the, the guarantor that this 95 percent or 90 percent or whatever target is set is is met the government has to provide appropriate incentives mm-hmm. to do that mm-hmm. But in terms of developing the technology itself, that's um, I, I think that's better left to yeah. others um, mm-hmm. at universities or in or private uh, companies. in private companies. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay, I think um, we're pretty much. I'm at the end of my questions, and um, uh, well, I, I, th- I want to thank um, the Rashio Institute as well as the SSE mm-hmm. for uh, inviting me over and for. An interesting couple of days of discussion. Really yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, from our part also. Mm-hmm. Many thanks for coming here and the lecture today and the talk yesterday also. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank thanks. you. Thanks.